This is the problem with black projects. They're completely isolated from the rest of the world. And they discovering things as if they found them themselves for the first time, while everyone else who may have been doing a lot of work on the subject is left out of the loop. That really people should be brought in from outside to help on this. You know, this is sure. something we're, we're, you know, why keep it secret? We all want to help out to uh, prepare for the next event. Okay. Like Are personally, I, I, my, my standpoint is, from what all the work I've done, I can only talk about probabilities that we are overdue for one, but I don't know when it's going to come. And I can say that within the next 400 years, there's a 90, over 90 percent chance we're going to have one, whether it's a small one or a large one, I don't know. So that's the best I can do. Now, I would uh, be saying something entirely different if I had real evidence that there was one, that somebody had actually detected one. And w this would have also an EMP, what we call EMP, electromagnetic pulse associated with it similar to what a high altitude nuclear explosion would do in the atmosphere. Well, are you the, that rare thing, uh, a scientist with a conscience? Is I, that why? I guess you'd say so, yeah. Uh, just me, I guess that uh, my interest is in helping humanity. And I'm interested in the truth and not living in some dream of some belief system that other people are telling you and doesn't fit the the data. Um. This is Bill Ryan and Kerry Cassidy from Project Camelot and this is Wednesday the 29th of July 2009 and we are in Laganisi which is just south of Athens in Greece and it's our very pleasure to be here because we are here with Dr. Paul Laviolette who is best described I believe as a, a maverick astrophysicist who has some very important theories that may possibly be of uh, some impact, if I dare use that word, to people on this planet at this time. And we're here to ask Paul to explain the, the, the hypothesis of the galactic superwave. And that's the smallest nutshell I can put this into. So Paul, why don't you introduce yourself and say something about your background? Well, I grew up in a family of scientists in Schenectady, New York. Uh, both my parents had worked on the Manhattan Project. My father was a nuclear engineer working on nuclear submarines at the time. So I was exposed at an early age to n nuclear reactors and nuclear physics. Uh, I was sort of a science buff from very early with hobbies in chemistry, electronics, uh, pyrotechnics. That was the uh, fellow on the street who was launching rockets from his backyard. Uh, almost had a, a pretty bad accident. It was sort of just a stroke of luck <laughs> that I didn't get hurt badly. Um, we moved to Greece for a couple of years and that was quite an experience when I was in high school. Um, uh, I went to Johns Hopkins for my BA in physics. I then did an MBA. I uh, was a constant subjector, so I did two years. In the middle of my business degree, I took off two years to do alternative service. I was working at Harvard doing uh, research on public health, on uh, re respiratory protection of workers. Um, then, uh, after finishing at the University of Chicago, my MBA, I went to uh, I did my PhD in uh, system science at Portland State University and that took quite a few years to go through that and uh, then I founded the Starburst Foundation upon graduating and that's still going. It's a research institute. Um, what is it researching? <clears throat> well I founded it uh, with the purpose of investigating further the superwave phenomenon and in the event that a, a signs of a superwave were about to uh, be arriving that we would go into high gear alerting it's sort of like a uh, like when you have the first warning signs of an earthquake that you start alerting everyone uh, and we were dealing here with a phenomenon that few people knew about 
So I felt uh, obligated to try to do my best to inform people about this new concept. So did you train and hire people for, uh, that were able to handle and understand the science behind mm -hmm. the super wave? We, at one time we had some volunteers help out when we, for example, were getting ice core samples uh, from Holland to help prepare the, the chest to bring the ice. And, but we never really had funding, uh, serious funding, to be able to hire people. Okay. Um, most of the charitable institutions were interested in funding the arts, and they figured science is left to the National Science Foundation and NASA, but they tend to fund very uh, conventional type research that fits exactly with the paradigm. So what you're saying basically is that you've created this institute, did you call it, um, or would you call it a think tank? or? Uh... I would call it a research institute. Institute, uh, okay. And, and in, in theory it's there in case this, you find that the super wave really is on the way. But in a sense, haven't you found that that is true already? Uh, well, yeah, there is a super wave uh, on the way uh, from the center of the galaxy. It's 23,000 light years travel uh, distance. And I believe there's not one but several hmm. on their way towards us. Um, there were other purposes for the foundation also was to do further work on a physics that I developed called subquantum kinetics which has new implications both for technology and for cosmology. In fact, it completely uh, revises the way we re regard the world, the universe. Also, uh, I've done some work in uh, psychology Back area up. of thought formation. And so that was a third possible area we could investigate. But also alternative energy was in a fourth topic. So all of these. Okay, uh, so you're saying that there is a galactic superwave on the way, and you think mm. there's more than one? Yes, yeah, several. Several? Mm hmm. Okay, and the reason you think there's more than one is? Well, uh, you, you look at the past to understand the future. In this case, you're dealing with a cyclic phenomenon, and we have the uh, ice core record from both uh, Antarctica and Greenland. And uh, people have measured beryllium-10, which is an indicator of cosmic ray intensity on the surface of the Earth. So it sort of gives you a chart of how cosmic ray intensity has varied over the last few hundred thousand years. And going back, you see these peaks. Uh, I had predicted you would find peaks uh, when I did my PhD dissertation on this topic at uh, Portland State University and later the data came out and indeed there were peaks um, and you can take this and analyze it to look at, for the periods the, you find it, it's there are certain periods that sort of come out of this data and uh, one of them is around 26 to 28 thousand years which is approximating the uh, precessional cycle of the earth and, and in fact the two tend to match up in a certain way which is very interesting um, another is around 11,500 years, and the third one, there's one around 5,700 years, which is close to the Mayan calendar cycle. And you see that there was a major event at the end of the Ice Age between 11,000 and 16,000 years ago, and uh, that we are, in fact, overdue now for another one. Uh, there were smaller events. You see a small event around 5,300 years ago. It, it lasted maybe 20 years or so. Uh, and there were, there's also very small events uh, averaging every 500 years or so since then. There were 14 small puffs of gas that were emitted from the galactic center, which indicate it was active. And but it wasn't active enough to create a peak that you could see in the record. So you, you determine this by looking at the ice cores and the amount of debris in them, mm. am I wrong? Well, they were analyzing beryllium-10, which is a radioactive element. It's produced in the atmosphere by cosmic rays. 
uh, it doesn't originate on Earth because being ra radioactive, it eventually dissipates, uh, decays away. Um, it has a half-life longer than carbon-14, so they can go back further than with carbon-14 with this. Okay, so when you say there's a small event, what is a small event comprised of? How does that affect the Earth? Small event, the small event that happened 5,300 years ago that was just a little spike uh, and was easily missed. It was only uh, seen because the, this particular researcher did a very detailed study of the core and they, they found it. Uh, without remarking what it was, uh, I was the one that called attention to it. Uh, at the same time, another researcher found the climate cooled inexplicably at that time and became dry. In fact, in the Andes, they found uh, Lonnie Thompson, glaciologist who I worked with uh, at the time I was doing my PhD research. He, he was the one who sent me samples from, from the uh, Camp Century ice core that I had analyzed. Uh, he found, his team found actual vegetation frozen in the ice, sort of like flash frozen, still had a green color, you know, uh, as if there was some hailstorm at that time. It, it's the same year they found the Iceman, the, the dating the Iceman and the Alps, it dates to about the same time. So it seems like there was sudden blizzards that occurred about that time. So are you extrapolating that the super wave could cause an ice age? Um, in this case, it, it didn't, the small event didn't cause an ice age, but it did cause cooling. But in, in a larger event, we see these events uh, occurring at the time of the initiation of, of the last ice age. Uh, you see them lining up not only with the beginning of the ice age, but also with the ending and with major climatic transitions in between. So there's a definite connection between climate and the superwaves. Okay. I want to ask some questions here. Sure. Paul, on behalf of a lot of uh, intelligent listeners we have who, who are alert to your name and to the fact that you have been saying some things that are considered by many intelligent people to be important, but they still don't know what a superwave is. I wonder if you can back right up and tell our viewers what is a superwave and do they exist or is it just a hypothesized event and why should they care? <clears throat> superwave consists of cosmic ray electrons, gamma rays, x-rays, light, radio waves across the whole spectrum uh, along with a gravity wave and this tra is all traveling at the speed of light towards our solar system. In fact, it, it propagates throughout the whole galaxy, uh, sort of like a spherical shell traveling out from the center of the galaxy. So, in simplistic terms, it's, it's an enormous cosmic scale galactic explosion coming from the center of the galaxy. Right. We've all heard of gamma ray bursts. And yes. in fact, uh, some scientists have uh, theorized that the gamma rays are accompanied by charged particles coming along with them. That it's actually charged particles that generate the gamma rays on the way. And this, this is what a superwave is, except on a much larger scale, instead of a burst just of a fraction of a second, we're dealing with something that could continue for hundreds, even thousands of years. When so, you say it could continue for hundreds of thousands of years, are you talking about it could travel for hundreds of thousands of years and take that long to get here? Or are you talking about its actual <coughs> impact on Earth lasting for hundreds of thousands of years? The actual period uh, that the Earth would be going through this storm, you can think of it as a galactic storm, okay. could be anywhere from a few hundred years to thousands of years, like 4,000 years, maybe 5,000 years. So are you seeing traces that in the past, because you said every 26,000 years that there is evidence of this, um, in, and it matches with the precession of the equinox, are you saying that during that time there's evidence that it stayed around, its impact was that lasted for up to 4,000 years, or at those times did it last for shorter periods? Well, if you look at the, the record, in my book I show the beryllium-10 record, you see, for example, around 40,000 years ago, 
it was quite a hefty peak there, uh, lasting 5,000 years, the whole thing. And this is actually one event that there's been a lot of study on by other glaciologists, and they all agree that co the cosmic ray intensity went up in a real fashion at that time. Um, although they've proposed an alternative theory of supernova explosion. Uh, without without saying where is the supernova, you know, they suggested a, a star nearby exploded. My answer to that is, this happens very rarely. To have a star explode that close to cause the cosmic ray intensity to significantly increase on Earth, and we're talking about many peaks. You know, they were sort of just wanted to explain the one, but what about? I mean, there's uh, in the record that we have, there's something like 12 to 15 peaks. And these are cyclical, so in essence, stars don't explode on a cyclical basis. That's as the far other as thing. We know. Yeah. Okay. Go Let ahead, me Bill. Ask you, Paul. Is there a hypothesized, sorry, a a recognized hypothesized mechanism whereby whatever it is at the center of the galaxy, and most astrophysicists think it's a black hole, would actually emit these super waves on a cyclical basis? Is there some some theoretical background for the existence of that periodicity? I haven't heard uh, them put forth something to explain th the cyclic nature. Um, I think that they find it sort of mysterious. The, je the conventional view, because they see this going on in other galaxies, they're called exploding galaxies or ciphered galaxies, quasars, these are various names for the same sort of thing. At one time they thought qua a quasar was uh, an unusual object in space, when in fact it turns out it's a galaxy whose center has become so bright that it looks star-like and they don't see the galaxy itself. But with the sp space telescope they found the arms there. Um, they uh, would think that these exploding galaxies have a cycle on the order of several hundred million years and that the period of the explosion would last about a, several, a, a few million years um, with the idea that if it happened in our own galaxy because they also would say well it, it's possible it would happen in our galaxy too but they say, well, we're in the quiescent period now, which should hold for at least another 50 million years, so we shouldn't be worrying about it. Uh, and even if it did, the conventional view is that these cosmic rays would be held back by the magnetic fields. That, uh, these would come to re our rescue to hold the, back the cosmic rays from leaving the center of the galaxy. Um, so to get back to your theory, though, of, of what you call the super wave, um, you see evidence that we are in the midst of a super wave now, or several of them, you're saying? No, they haven't arrived. We're in the eye of the hurricane, sort of the, the period, the nice sunny period in between the storm, before the storm arrives. And the, the thing is that you, you can't see them coming because they travel at the speed of light. So it's a phenomenon that's totally without warning, just like a gamma ray burst. They only know it when their detectors pick it up, and then they're able to locate where it came from. Well, if it's coming to our, uh, our solar system, wouldn't other planets be affected before we would? Yes. It affects all planets, all stars So in, in a sense, you could see it coming if you saw the effects on other planets before it hit Earth. Is that right? Well, the light from those effects on the other planets also travels the speed of light. Oh. So it actually lags behind the actual event itself. Yeah. This is something, I mean, I understand very well that this is something that you can't see happening because of the nature of the limit of the speed of light. And this is something that travels out of the speed of light. So basically, this comes up and hits you from behind, as it were, and you've got no warning. Yeah. There, there would be only one way I could see that you could have warning. If, uh, let's say, a hypothesis, there, there were civilizations in the galaxy, there was intelligent life, that w recognized the importance of knowing when these were coming and set up outposts at different points that were able to relay a signal 
that was superluminal, in other words, travel faster than the speed of light, uh, to get the warning here so we know exactly when the next one was going to arrive. That's possible. Okay, well, we actually have a witness, uh, Jake Simpson, we call him Jake Simpson, mm -hmm. who has said that they did send a superluminal craft outside the solar, this solar system and that they have seen a wave approaching. He called it a wave. Um, we're not sure if he actually meant a wave, but in essence, they saw something headed toward us. Um, and and who, is, who is they? It, the people that he works for in Black Projects, basically. Oh. So this is who, Jake Simpson. Mm. So that, that was one of the reasons that we were sort of interested in hearing your theory, because in many ways it seemed to coincide with what he was saying they it, saw. And how close is it, did he say? In this period of, of years between now and 2017. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it was very interesting. It was a conversation which um, I personally had with him last October when we met. He's not a physicist, he's an intelligent man, he's worked with four black projects on the inside and he's saying things to us that are at the limit of what he can say. What he said was that there is a wave coming and he stressed that the wave was a sort of loose term, as a metaphor. He said to think of it in terms of a wave, he said, mm -hmm. he said about that. Mm -hmm. and I have no idea whether he's acquainted with your theories. Or well this is the problem with black projects, they're completely isolated from the rest of the world and they discovering things as if they found them themselves for the first time while everyone else who may have been doing a lot of work on the subject is left out of the loop sure. and uh, the, the only people that lose out are the human race basically because here's uh, I've been working on super waves uh, since 1979 mm -hmm. so about 30 years and uh, I would be happy to work with them uh, to uh, you know, I, I believe I'd have something to contribute if they did have some information like that. Sure. To so, well, I mean, actually, is it possible that they are following your work, uh, benefiting well, from it, I'm sure it, they et bought my book and it's circulated among the Black Project scientists. So. Especially if your parents, as you said, worked in the Manhattan Project. They're well, regardless of that. Uh, okay. I think there's, they're searching for new ideas all the time to sort of funnel this into what they're doing. Uh, I think to some extent they, they realize that they, they don't have all the ideas, that there's interesting stuff out there. Um, but um, I think it, it's uh, they, that really people should be brought in from outside to help on this. You know, this is sure. something we, we're, you know, why keep it secret? We all want to help out to uh, prepare for the next event. Okay. Like Are personally, I, I, my, my standpoint is from what all the work I've done, I can only talk about probabilities that we are overdue for one, but I don't know when it's gonna come because I'm looking at the past record, I see the cycles, I, I see when the last events occurred and I can say, that within the next 400 years, there's a 90, over 90% chance we're going to have one. Whether it's a small one or a large one, I don't know. So that's the best I can do. Now, I would uh, be saying something entirely different if I had real evidence that there was one, that somebody had actually detected one. Um, well, Starburst Foundation, for example, would go into high gear to say, you know, we've got to start preparing. We're not prepared for something like this not even for a Carrington event solar flare, which okay. could wipe out uh, all the power systems if we had one. So are you saying that the super wave would, would result in the wiping out of the power systems? Oh yeah. Um, what other effects would it have? The thing is the super wave on its forefront would have a very um, dense uh, sort of shock front of cosmic rays. Um, and it w this would have also an EMP, what we call EMP, electromagnetic pulse associated with it, similar to what a high altitude nuclear explosion would do in the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And when this arrives, it's going to create similar phenomena, just like the starburst, ex a starfish explosion, I believe it was near Hawaii, and it, when the EMP wave arrived, there were whole uh, sections of the island who 
were having blackouts as a result. It also would fry electronic circuits, uh, phones would go out. Um, we've had even small, smaller events like gamma ray bursts affect the communication systems and do damage to our communication systems. So something like this would uh, pretty much roast all the satellite equipment we've got. Cell telephones wouldn't be working. TV would be off the air if it depended on satellite. Um, perhaps telephones would continue to work if it was fiber optic that was insulated from this sort of thing. Your power lines would pick up the pulse, uh, the wires would have a huge voltage surge which would fry the transformers, the step down transformers to go from your million volt voltages down to your um, voltages you use in your house. Wouldn't it always also um, affect the cars that we have now? The, um, the cars that are all now with chips in them, uh, in a case of a EMP from a nuclear explosion, for example, they warn that uh, it could fry the chips in a car. Um, and this is something that could last 400 years, you're saying, once well, it Well, the, the for forefront, we're talking about something that might just be minutes. Okay. Uh, and it would be probably preceded by a gravity wave, which would cause earthquakes, seismic uh, events all over the Earth, okay. not just in one place. Um, so that might be the first warning, actually, things shaking. Um, Let me back up just a fraction again to help our viewers <coughs> understand this and also to help me understand this. Um, is a super wave, does a super wave incorporate um, a gamma ray burst or are these two different phenomena that you're describing? They're a little different. Uh, the gamma ray bursts they talk about are usually from isolated stellar explosions, perhaps very very powerful supernova explosions. And they have some special physics involved there that the stars are very unusual, like neutron stars colliding and so on. Okay. The, the thing is that whatever they are, we can only guess because they're so far away. Most of the uh, gamma ray bursts that we are picking up come from other galaxies, millions of light years away. Yes. Um, there's been only one case, we've observed one that came from within our galaxy, it was a place near the galactic center but not at the core. And what's unusual there is that uh, about uh, two days before the gamma ray burst arrived was the worst uh, seismic event that we've had in 30 years that caused the uh, 2004 uh, Boxer Day tsunami in Malaysia. And, uh, over 250,000 people who died in that event. So you're saying that was caused by a gamma ray <clears throat> explosion? Gamma ray burst. burst. This was the first one they'd found um, that was emitted from within our galaxy. It was the most intense that they'd ever observed in the history of gamma ray observatory physics. And the coincidence of being just shortly after the worst earthquake we've had in 40 years, it's, um, you can do the probabilities and you come with very small probabilities due to chance. So you're saying this gamma ray versus a super wave, if you were to compare them as, as events, would you say that the super wave is, um, it sounds like it's much more long range, much more uh, it would impact uh, <coughs> For, much, for years at a time, yeah. and it's cyclical, as opposed to the gamma ray bursts that yeah. maybe aren't explainable? The gamma ray burst, probably the source star ends up blowing itself up completely into smithereens, so there's no cycle involved. Uh -huh. Whereas core explosions, we're dealing with the m massive object at the center of the galaxy. Scientists call it a black hole. I don't believe in black holes, and I know other astrophysicists that don't believe in black holes. Um, but I do believe it's a very massive object. It's a core, I believe it's a core of a star. In natural evolution, a star will eject its atmosphere and you're left with a very dense core. It has a density similar to a white dwarf star, which is like, let's say, one ton per cubic centimeter, or in extreme case, go to the density of a neutron star, which is a million times greater. Um, I mean, we're talking about a spiral galaxy whose core object has evolved to the point where it's starting this outburst cycle. 
uh, and by the way, that's how a galaxy is formed. The, these outbursts actually participate in the formation of the galaxy. That's what causes this spiral phenomenon, because without these outbursts, the spiral arms would wind up on themselves. This is a, a problem which astrophysicists have wondered about. Why don't the spiral arms wind up as it turns? Mm -hmm. Well, it's because you have these periodic outbursts coming out, and they sort of propel everything. But do you know what causes that? The periodic I, I, uh, Yeah, I have a theory that comes out of subquantum kinetics. And the, the, in subquantum kinetics, you have a continuous creation of matter and energy. It, basically, a violation of the first law of thermodynamics, which is no big deal. You know, maybe physicists would consider it a big deal. But the point is that we're talking about a level that's 10 orders of magnitude smaller than what they can observe in the laboratory. And in fact, I have uh, suggested an experiment where they can observe it in space with microwave signals between spacecraft. And I've published the amount of the energy increase of a photon over that period of distance. And uh, in fact, they, they ended up finding this. And it's today called the pioneer effect. OK, uh, so this uh, sub-quantum kinetic, uh, what do you call, particles? Uh, it's a theory. Of Subquantum kinetics is a, the name I gave to the physics. Um, it's resulting from taking concepts in system theory, with the area I was studying for my PhD work. You bring, if you bring systems concepts into physics um, <clears throat> and bring, for example, models that are, have been developed in the area of um, chemistry, of how chemical waves form. And I realized that these, for example, are form a very good model for describing how a particle forms in space. And you find that it solves a lot of problems, which phys physics had before. Physics traditionally has been based on mechanics. And we're talking about a chemical approach, a chemical reaction approach to physics. Actually, you could say it's alchemical, and there's an ancient, it ties in with ancient ideas, too. Is this, does this relate to hyperdimensional physics and particles being waves, depending mm -hmm. on how you look at them? Okay, it does postulate existence of higher dimensions. Um, it, it, the, the basic idea, which is what steered me into the, all of this work that I've been doing, was the realization that the basis of existence is flux. And this is totally different from what physicists have been teaching. Physicists te teach that the basis of existence is structure. There are particles that are somehow bound to each other. Even quarks, they speak of quarks and gluons, glue that holds them together, so to speak. If they began talking about flux, that the, they, from their point of view, because see physics is positivist science. They want to observe, to actually say, well, there it is, I observe it. Where is this flux? Well, they can't see it, and you can't see this flux because it's at an etheric level. You, you postulate an ether as the substrate forming physical phenomena. A gamma wave, <coughs> uh, gamma ray burst, basically is a local event that comes from a supernova, and we've all, uh, which is hugely destructive and powerful, and we're quite fortunate not to have any near us. And we've basically mainly seen them, if I understand it right, in neighboring galaxies. But the superwave is something different, which is cyclical, is accompanied by a gravity wave, is accompanied by cosmic ray debris, and lasts quite a long time, like a storm, hmm. and leaves its imprints and its, uh, and its echoes materially in ice core samples, which is the tangible evidence that you have that there's something going on here that's not being recognized. Can you speak to all of that and lay this out simply for mm. people so that they okay. can mm. sort of see the territory we're talking about here? Um, we, we also have supernova explosions in our own galaxy, but they're not of the kind of the very powerful that cause these gamma ray bursts unless when we're seeing these uh, gamma ray bursts, what it is is just a clump of very energetic particles that happen to come our way 
at that moment. And the, the, when scientists are saying it was very, very powerful, they're saying, imagine that this was the same energy from whatever angle you viewed this star. And, and, that, and it would end up totaling to a huge astronomical amount of energy. But if it was just a, a clump of a, a burst, a, a collimated burst that happened to come, then you're down to more reasonable levels. So it all, and the thing is, we don't really know. You know, it's, uh, these things are so far away. But we do know that the, the, superno the supernova explosions that have happened within our galaxy don't really affect us that much unless it happens to be one very close, like within 30 light years, which is a very rare event. But the uh, core explosions are different in that instead of just a, a, a fraction of a second for the event, you're talking about anything from several years for a very minor event to 4,000, 5,000 years duration. Um, and the, the longer events can actually start affecting climate because what they do is they, bring co they vaporize cometary ice which is surrounding our solar system end up end up pushing this uh, nebular material into the solar system and it affects the way light gets to the earth from the sun it ends up energizing the sun it falls onto the sun and the sun becomes more active and more of a flaring flaring star and actually it, the sun ends up then doing more damage to earth than the superwave itself the superwave is sort of the, what gets this dust in and then you, you get worse things happening. So is it possible that solar cycle 24 could be acting um, on, on the Earth mm -hmm. as a result of a super wave that's, that's no. going to hit the sun? No. No, because we're in the in-between period, in-between super waves. Uh, the solar system is fairly clean of dust. I mean, if the solar system was packed with dust like the level I'm talking about, we would all see it. You would see the moon being blotted out by a dust cloud or the oh, wow. sun, huge dust cloud going across the sun. I mean, it would be definitely coast to coast news. So we're <laughs> at both sides of the planet. Are these dust clouds, um, these dust clouds, aren't they also traveling at the speed of light from the galactic core? No, no, the dust doesn't come from the core of the galaxy. Right. It's already around our solar system and it's pretty much stationary, relatively stationary, just orbiting the sun normally. But when the, uh, the super wave arrives, it, it creates a sort of a shock front around the solar system because the solar system has magnetic fields around it. Okay. And it, it creates what they call bow shock in the, uh, around the heliopause. Heliopause is the name of the sort of protective sheath of magnetic fields okay. around the solar system and and in the magnetic fields the the superwave particles tend to get trapped to some extent and build up to very high levels high enough uh, density of cosmic ray energy to actually start vaporizing ice and when that happens so it, it's actually able to raise the temperature from close to uh, let's say 10 degrees uh, above absolute zero up to the level where the ice could vaporize and release uh, both dust and water vapor or gas into, the, uh, into space and this stuff gets pushed in as it's being pushed in by the superwave cosmic rays because it's like a battle between the solar wind and the superwave cosmic rays. Solar wind is sort of expelling this dust but then the superwave is pushing this in and it will actually compress the magnetic field sheath that's around the solar system inward okay. and put it could in, in my thesis uh, which I uh, published in 1983 on galactic core explosions and their effect on the earth and solar system I was suggesting that the sheath at the end of the ice age actually got pushed in almost to Mars orbit and uh, so from there, it's just a short hop to, for this dust then to come in around the sun. And it, it would actually produce a cocoon around the sun uh, so that the sun wouldn't be yellow like we see. It would actually be reddish. Uh, okay. Okay. So let me feed back to you what I think that you're saying. Hmm. What you're saying is that the superwave creates a huge energetic impact 
on the dynamic systems in the solar system. And then that uh, causes um, so many energetic complications, and, and I'm speaking very generally here deliberately, mm. that that's actually what uh, uh, creates the major changes in weather that could last several thousand of years, because the reverberations electromagnetically and in the dust clouds and the behavior of the sun and everything else are going to cause quite a long ripple effect locally after this super wave itself is actually is yeah. all over. Approximately yeah, think, think of this as uh, in systems concepts. Think of a system mm -hmm. and they speak of perturbing the system with right. an outside influence of force or something. Yeah. The solar system, and in fact the Earth's climatic system, is here being perturbed by conditions that normally don't exist today. Right. Uh, the, whole, the whole energetics around the Earth changes. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, if, if it's in place for decades and decades, that's long enough for the Earth's climatic system to get perturbed into, let's say, an ice age. Yeah. Or to come out of an ice age. But if it was very brief, it wouldn't be long enough to cause this huge climatic shift that we've seen. But you are saying that this, you've observed that this is cyclical, and you've observed that this happens every 26,000 years, and if you're pulling in, from what I understand in your book, you're pulling in, you know, astrology, the tarot, the, the Mayan calendar, and all these sort of prophecies that, you know, the Hopi, how the Hopi say there are different ages that, that we go through. In a sense, you must be predicting one coming fairly soon, right, according right. to the cycle. Yeah, well, I found cycles of 28,000, 11,500, and 5,700 years. This was study done by some people in state of Washington, who did some number crunching as a sort of contribution to Starburst. We do have people that help out uh, at times. Uh, and with that, we could see that we're overdue presently. Uh, but before they had done this was to get more of a scientific, uh, a accurate estimation of the cy cycles, you could see my own work I did just by eyeballing it and could see that there was this uh, both 13,000 and 26,000s year period there, but I was l a little off perhaps. Uh, in the short one, it's more close to 11,500, and then there's the 5,700 year period. Um, so if it arrives faster than the speed of light, then, um, mm, not faster. I, I'm suggesting at the speed of light, uh, although the gravity wave would have been slightly superluminal at the very beginning if it was due to an explosive outburst uh, that would have caused it to get a slight head, head start. Um, but pretty much the whole thing travels at the speed of light towards this. So then it could happen at any time. What is, I mean, you know, am I right? Yeah, and yeah, we're in the danger happened, period. We're, we're sort of like, uh, you have to realize, which a lot of scientists don't because their theories still believe the galactic core explosions are every hundred million years, but you have to realize that we're on the fringe of a, of a volcano, a galactic volcano. And it's, uh, it's an active volcano, and we, are, we should be expecting the eruption very shortly. When you say very shortly, because I, I understand you're looking very long range, what's very shortly? Is that in a year, two years, four years, hundred years? I, I don't know. Uh, I only go out on the limb and I say there's a 90 percent chance in the next 400 years of this happening. Oh, I, see. <laughs> I, I think I'm pretty safe uh, that something will happen, even if it's a small outburst, because Astronomy, we've been around really modern astronomy for a few hundred years now. We haven't seen any bright uh, uh, luminosities come from the galactic center. Um, what about the, the fact that we're, um, we're coming equal with the uh, galactic center? Does that affect any of this or make it more likely or <laughs> the way it hits us change? No, that, um, that, that uh, 
that's the, what you're talking about, the Mayan uh, calendar and the uh, sun crossing the galactic plane. Um, there's no effect there. It's more you have to look at the period and when the last event happened. And it's interesting that the 5,300 year event, a small event of 20 year duration or so, occurred just before the beginning of the Mayan calendar cycle, the one that we're currently in. Uh, that cycle began 5,126 years before 2000 or before 2012, so um, around 3100 BC. Whereas we're seeing this event was around 3300 BC, plus or minus a few hundred years, because we don't know accurately from the dating. We're, we're relying on ice core dating, and it could be a little off. You know, maybe it's off by 100 years or so. What I want to achieve here is some way of, of assisting many people who watch our videos to understand the scientific basis for which it's plausible that something might be coming this way that is in our interest to understand and possibly even to prepare for, that people are picking up intuitively, they're reading things on the internet, things get distorted and muddied around and they don't know what they're reading, and they hear these terms like superwave and gamma ray burst, and they don't know what they mean, and they don't know okay. whether this is um, <clears throat> mumbo jumbo, whether it's really something that could affect their lives and change their lives, and they don't know what basis there is for taking these things seriously and digging more into it. And the reason why we're here talking to you is because you're the man who represents and is the spokesperson for these important ideas. And I say they're important ideas because any hypothesis in physics is an important idea. Um, even if it's disproved, it was an important idea until it's disproved, and this takes the whole thing forward, as you'll understand. So, the opportunity here is for you to explain to the listeners, to the watchers, to the viewers, as best as you can, how it is that these phenomena should be taken seriously in mm. your recommendation. Mm. What impact they might have on us, what are the probabilities, is this catastrophism that we should be ignoring and say, you know what, everything's going to be fine, um, because it's always been fine, or maybe the geological record shows that things have not always been fine and we should be on the alert because we're we're living in an unstable planet in a very dynamic system that's affected by all kinds of things which we're only on the verge of starting to understand. Well, what you're saying uh, is the same questions that went through my mind. Is this a real phenomenon? And that's what caused me to change the topic of my dissertation, my PhD work, to investigate the superwave phenomenon. Uh, in 1979, when I first discovered that this might occur, I formed a hypothesis, I called it the galactic explosion hypothesis, and convinced my co dissertation committee to, that I could do this as a, to test this hypothesis. <clears throat> and, um, and that I could uh, produce a PhD on this, uh, which I couldn't have done at a lot of universities. It happened I was in a program that was very interdisciplinary. So the idea of bringing evidence from ver various areas from geology, astronomy, paleontology, high energy physics was fitting with this program. And um, the, in the end, I, I summarized the evidence and found that it all seemed to support this uh, concept that a superwave had indeed passed through our solar system between 11 and 16,000 years ago causing uh, major effects to the climate. And we had uh, a, a very significant mass extinction that was called the Pleistocene extinction where uh, large mammals uh, died along with the species of birds and a number of other animals and some people have said it's the worst extinction to have occurred since the uh, extinction of the dinosaurs. Um, and uh, I was also drawing from ancient legends although I didn't include that in the dissertation, but I, I do believe that that's a valuable source of information. All the flood myths, for example. Flood myths, the story of the sun burning the earth, uh, Scorpio being stung by, uh, or uh, Oris being stung by the scorpion. Sto scorpion is a sign in the direction of the galactic center. 
um, things like this. This is where the tail of the scorpion in the astrological symbol actually points towards the galactic center. Right. As if the ancients are trying to tell us something. Yeah, there's uh, two arrows in the astrological uh, symbols. Uh, now, they remember that the signs, what we call the astrological signs, are actual constellations out there. And this is how they're originally formed as star constellations that there are two arrows in the zodiac one is the uh, Sagittarius arrow and the other is the tail of the scorpion and they're both pointing it seems at something and this was my first uh, connection I made between astrology and the galactic core explosion uh, ph phenomenon when I realized that the center of the galaxy was in that region where they were pointing so the so what you were positing there was the, the ancient astrologers, who are also astronomers, were actually trying to leave a message for us in such a way that it right. would get lost over time. Right. I believe that the zodiac was a cryptogram, a time capsule message that was created to warn the future civilization on our planet. Okay. So about that's where your intellectual journey started, but presumably you couldn't start right. with a PhD thesis. Right. I, I didn't include any of that. It's... I mean, who cares really where you got your idea? The point is you make a hypothesis and you're testing it. Well, is there scientific evidence for it? And uh, this is the, the main thing from the scientific standpoint that you're, you're concerned with. Uh, but what you say is that there is no uh, pole, rev pole shift, that you don't see evidence of actual, um, and, and maybe you can explain this to me, but my understanding is you say that there is there weren't pole shifts at those 26,000 year um, periods, but there were, there was or, instead this galactic superwave explosion. Or even 13,000 or 12,000 year cycles. Um, right. That I, I believe that the climatic shifts that people have uh, other, I don't know if you want to call them scientists, uh, theoreticians, uh -huh. have suggested that, that the pole shift was involved in creating a climatic change. Uh, that, uh, first of all, there's so many shifts of climate, just even during the Younger Dryas, which was between 11,600 and 13,000 years ago, you, you see something like uh, 40 major shifts of climate within that cold period. And to say that was due to uh, the shifting back and forth of the pole gets to be a little absurd. Um, okay. What's your response to the good work, or no, let me say, to the serious work of Charles Hapgood and, and Rand Flemath and more lately Colin Wilson, who's been <coughs> popularizing the idea, I mean, we tend to call it pole shifts, but they're talking about crustal displacement. Mm -hmm. um, I understand that you don't feel that the crustal displacement theory is valid, and it'd be very, very no. interesting to hear why that is. Uh, it, you know, if the evidence supported, I would be for it. But you know, you just go to the ice core evidence to test that theory. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Mr. Flamath was talking about Antarctica being sort of up closer to where Chile is during the ice age, and it had suddenly shifted down to its present position at the end of the ice age. Okay, if that was true, then you would expect the climate in, in Antarctica which should have been warmer during the ice age. And you don't see that. And I, I, I sent him something like four climatic curves from Antarctica, which showed it was colder during the ice age and from different parts of Antarctica. It, it didn't seem to sway him, I guess, but um, f from me, looking at that data, that rules out a shifting of the poles. So, any kind of crustal, so... Plus it would have caused uh, sloshing of the oceans, you would expect, if there was such a thing, and then how come we don't find salt water deposits inland? We do find flood deposits, but it's due to fresh water, which I've suggested is due to uh, the melting of the ice sheets, catastrophic melting. Could catastrophic melting of the ice sheets explain the great flood? Yes. Myths? Yeah. That much water? Um, yeah, it's something that doesn't happen today because we don't have ice sheets. We do have uh, sort of ice caps like in 
Iceland. We have situations where the uh, glacier there is melted in a certain area by a volcano and creates a sort of a reservoir of water which eventually bursts through a dam and pours down and they call this a glacier burst. These are very small scale compared to what was happening during the Ice Age. So in order for there to have been a great flood like, like the one described in the myths, the ice sheet would have had to have been much larger and sea level lower than it is at the moment and then it would have to be a catastrophic melting. And your theory is that that could only have been produced by some huge cosmic scale event which you are calling the superwave. It, it, it was right. mainly the sun involved. The superwave triggered the conditions for the sun becoming more active okay. and also the cosmic dust around the earth actually creates in some cases a warming effect because it can actually scatter light that normally go out into space back onto the earth, creates sort of an interplanetary hothouse effect. Okay. And this was something not only going on on the earth but also we see evidence on Mars of canyons uh, appear to have been cut by tremendous floods of water. Yes. Uh, and I believe that Mars is mostly covered by ice sheet. It's sort of like a tundra. Uh-huh. Uh, and, and the w- actual walls of the canyons are actually ice that would have melted uh, during some of these events. Especially there's cases where the Earth was being hit by cro- super-sized coronal mass ejections. We have evidence from the moon of glazed rocks and w- one NASA scientist was suggesting that the uh, moon or was exposed to uh, very intense radiation from the sun to do this, something like a uh, hundred times greater luminosity of the sun for at least a hundred seconds. And in my dissertation I suggested the alternative that perhaps uh, both the earth and moon had gotten engulfed in a coronal mass ejection and that this was uh, hot enough to actually melt particles on the moon. Does your theory um, accommodate the loss of water on Mars as a result of a superwave action upon the sun? Or uh, Can you say more about the loss of water on Mars? Well, my understanding is that Mars used to have water and um, maybe even plentiful water and that at some point it, it, it disappeared and there are different theories to explain that disappearance. No, it's, Mars is about two kilometers deep in ice. Right now it, you It's mean. covered with an ice sheet from pole to pole. There might be, you might find some areas that, where, where it's more a rock, but for the most part it's ice. Why does it look like dust, like a dusty surface? It's because on Mars, when the sun shines on this icy surface, the, the ice sublimates, it turns directly to gas and leaves the dust behind. And so the, for the first few centimeters is just dust. But below that is what you, we would call permafrost. Has this been validated by the rover that, you know, the Mars rover? Yeah, they, they had samples? a rover thing going around just a few year ago or two. Right. They had pictures they sent back and sure enough there were chunks of white, which was really ice mixed in with the dirt. And the reason they know that it was ice, uh, they took picture a little while later when the sun had a chance to shine on it and it had disappeared, evaporated. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So this stuff is just below the surface. In fact, they see gullies which look like freshly formed by running water. So in some cases this, um, this ice melts as long as it's underground. There's enough pressure to make it turn into water and it, it can actually gush out from the sides of some of these canyons and create these ravines. Uh, That's pretty interesting. Okay. Uh, and all the and I was saying this uh, about Mars being covered with permafrost uh, way back. And as more and more data has come out with the satellites, they've been doing uh, radar sensing, and they find that it's uh, several kilometer or so deep with uh, water there. It's not pure water, it's mixed with dust and stuff. I wasn't aware of that. So, so going to Mars, there's no question that we will find water. I mean, wherever you land, all you have to do is get something to melt whatever you dig up, you know. Okay, let me take you back to the events of uh, um, 11, 12,000 years ago, whatever. 
um, one of the events on the legitimate historical record, according to Plato's Sinking of Atlantis, round about the same time as these mass extinctions of all the large mammals and so on and so forth. Is it possible that a super wave would be accompanied by the kind of gravity wave that I believe in your thinking? It doesn't cause a crustal displacement, but it, I think your words are, it jerks the planet to such a degree mm. <clears throat> that it can cause a serious um, uh, 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 impact. Yes. Resulting in yeah, you don't need to really have a huge displacement of the pole to cause major seismic disturbance on the uh, planet. Um, what about a ma magnetic pole shift? Is this <clears throat> related at all? Uh, I believe the magnetic pole shifts are due to the sun's effect on the Earth. And uh, what happens there, I describe it in my uh, thesis and articles, when a coronal mass ejection arrives, the cosmic ray, the solar cosmic ray particles get trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. And they, they produce what are called storm time radi uh, radiation belts around the Earth. And the particles end up drifting, the electrons in one direction, the protons in the other. And this generates what they call a ring current. This is all accepted geophysics and produces a magnetic field opposed to the Earth's field. And they observed this after the 1956 uh, solar proton event, when a coronal mass ejection, had fairly large one, had hit the Earth. And they observed a 1% decrease of the magnetic field at that time. And uh, so all you have to do is scale that up 100 times. And there were, in fact, uh, events that were that large uh, around the time of the extinction of the mammoths and ground sloths. And you do see carbon-14 spurts. This is uh, something I'm about to publish. This is very new. Uh, I've actually located in the ice core the event when that co uh, solar cosmic ray uh, uh, burst hit the uh, planet. Um, and that would have been enough uh, particle energy to actually cancel out the Earth's magnetic field. So you're saying that the sinking of Atlantis was resulted from that? No. Um, I, I have a totally different view of the Atlantis story. I believe it's an allegorical story. I, I don't believe, and I've argued with people who are Atlantis enthusiasts, they believe they're going to go out and find an island with moats and dikes around it. Now, that's the part in Critias, the Atlantis myth is broken into two parts, one in the Plato's book of Critias and one in Plato's book of Timaeus. The Critias myth is the creation of Atlantis, and the Timaeus myth is about the flood, uh, which if you date uh, w w the time it's set, given in Plato's myth, it comes to about 11,600 years ago, when in fact there was a very accelerated period of glacial melting that the sea level was rising very rapidly at that time. Uh, and you, so you were having flooding. Um, and I believe that in the Timaeus myth, Atlantis is symbolizing the ice sheet. The sinking signifies the ice sheet was melting. As you remember in the myth, it's talking about Atlantis uh, leaving behind a shoal of mud. Well, when ice melts and the floods subside, that's what you have, shoal of mud. So in effect, Atlantis, the ice sheet, the North American ice sheet, which is almost like a continent, they speak of it as a continent, uh, dissipated and is now in the, in the waters, in the ocean. Um, in fact, in the myth, in, in, excuse me, in Plato's book, uh, this is a discussion between uh, Solon, the ruler of Athens, and a priest in Egypt and at Sais in Egypt, and the priest tells him that this is a, uh, these myths, like the story of Atlantis or the, the conflagration myth about Thevan and the sun chariot, where the sun ended up burning the earth, that these are allegorical stories. They're not, these things didn't really happen the way the myths uh, describe. You have to infer that this is a parable. Look at it allegorically. And that, for example, he referred to the story of Thevan, 
that this really represents um, astronomical bodies in their effect on the Earth. In fact, in this case, the Sun. Um, so what about the, the ch they say that the magnetic poles are shifting now. Do you agree with that? By how much are they saying? <laughs> well, I'm not sure. Bill, can you explain? I think there is, like, they've actually said there is a, a noticeable shift recently. Yeah, I don't have the numbers. Um, my understanding is that it's recognized that there is a, that, that there looks to be a gradual shift happening because mm -hmm. of a weakness. Um, there seems to be a gradual shift happening. I don't have the numbers. Um, <coughs> if That may mean that it's hard for us to talk about it, but I thought that that was recognized. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, the intensity of the magnetic field has changed uh, over time. It's varied up and down by about 50% during the, the, this last interglacial, last 11,000 years. In fact, it's been weakening since uh, year 2000, 2,000 years ago. Okay. So, you know, that's a trend which probably could be continuing. I haven't looked at the same data you're talking about. Um, okay, but. so to get back to the, to the galactic superwave and its impact on Earth and when it could ha occur, um, what like what ha are you using predictive um, sort of uh, referencing certain things like the tarot, like astrology, like um, you know the I Ching, etc., in in a in to predict the coming of the superwave? No. Okay, so what it, are it's you all, using? It's all you know based based on uh, science, and and something we didn't get to is what is the evidence for the past event. I really didn't get into that. Okay. I, I, made a I made a series of predictions, and uh, one was if, and this was the key test that I performed, but there were others, um, was that if this had actually occurred, uh, it would have pushed cosmic dust into the solar system, and we should therefore see higher levels at that time. So I did a study of ice core samples. I was sent some by Lonnie Thompson, and I also got some ice directly from the ice core laboratory and processed it myself, and uh, used neutron activation analysis, which is a technique where you irradiate the dust that you filter out from the ice. You radiate a nuclear reactor and it becomes radioactive, and you see what's in it. And I was looking particularly for nickel and iridium, which, uh, for example, iridium is 10,000 times more abundant in cosmic material than it is in the typical crustal material. And, uh, in fact, found peaks where r the, the iridium level, for example, was uh, hundreds of times higher than what we normally get today. So it indicated something was really happening. Um, this was a discovery that was as significant as the discovery of the iridium peak at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. Now the difference there is you had a Nobel laureate in the team along with uh, three others who were members of the Berkeley faculty. I was with a uh, well, moderately known university, uh, Portland State, but I was in, not in a uh, astronomy program or geology program, I was in the systems program. Um, and uh, so this was passed over at the time. Uh, I did ha it was cited by some astronomers in the uh, UK, uh, Victor Klub, for his own theory, <laughs> actually before my results were published, which uh, ticked me off a little, um, saying that a comet had uh, hit the Earth around 14,000 years ago. As it turned out, uh, the dating, my dating was off uh, at that time and when I finally, because ice cores weren't properly dated in those days, this is uh, in the early 80s, and when I finally found the proper dating of the ice samples I, I dated, it turned out they were between 35,000 and 70,000 years old. So I was looking at a period in the early to middle ice age rather than the part I really wanted to test. Um, 
and actually the ice was missing from the ice record from that period because it had already been sampled. That was the most interesting area that researchers wanted to look at was at the end of the ice age. And so even if I wanted to, I couldn't have studied that part. Well, how do you account for that? Uh, why is the ice missing? Because yeah. uh, other researchers sampled that very heavily and all the ice got gobbled up. I came late in the game, so to speak. Uh, those cores had been around for at least five years before I started my test. Um, but you, what you're saying is, in essence, that you did prove the fact that there was this uh, an, an hmm. escalation in the amount of iridium, as you call well, it. Well, it was the first time elevated amounts of cosmic dust have been found in the ice record. In fact, one of the samples I found high levels of gold, which uh, would have been, uh, if there was a mineable deposit, you could have made a lot of money in that section. When was this? Uh, that was around 50,000 years back. Okay, so because, um, well, I'm not sure this is related at all, but my understanding, I don't know if you go back to the days of the Anunnaki when they supposed, you know, um, Zachariah Sitchin's work and the fact that they were mining gold to put into the atmosphere of their own planet to protect, to protect um, you know, from the sun's rays and so on, the loss of atmosphere. Is, is there any correlation there between your finding a lot of gold in the, um, the samples that you were getting 50,000 years ago? Well, gold is a uh, also enhanced material in cosmic dust. Uh, you find several hundred to a thousand times more gold in meteorites and cosmic dust than you do on typical earth crust material. So the earth I believe was being uh, exposed to increased amounts of gold dust. In fact gold nuggets could come from space. So you have myths, stories of gold meteor, you know, where they find a nugget. You know. And uh, in fact, this gold tends to be concentrated at the bottom of gravel deposits. Whenever there's a flood, the heavy stuff's going to deposit first. And so whatever was coming down ended up getting concentrated by these floods in certain layers. But um, anyway, that was one uh, victory uh, for the hypothesis. Also, um, I was noticing that the, um, the certain supernova explosions, in fact, uh, this was part of what in, tipped me off about the superwave phenomenon, that it wasn't just an explosion at the center of the galaxy, but something came out and was actually triggering supernova explosions as it moved out from oh, the center. Oh, okay. So it's actually affecting stars. It affects stars, yeah. Stars that are near ready to explode. There might be on the unstable, uh, unstable part of their history, um, end up exploding. And you, for example, the Vela supernova remnant occurred at the time when this superwave was moving through our area. The Vela is the closest supernova remnant to the solar system that's of the young remnants. And then the Crab Nebula, which was 6,000 light years further away, so it occurred later, and it's documented in the Chinese records at 1054 AD, July 4th, as <laughs> it turns out. That went off, and it was seen, and you have to figure it takes time for the light to come to us, so it's like 6,500 light years away in the direction opposite to the galactic center. So you have to allow six, about 6,500 years for the superwave to get out there. Then it triggers this, and there's another 6,500 or so years. So that's why we saw it more recently. Um, and when I plotted the new supernova remnants, uh, I found that they tend to line up on this event horizon, as I call it. It's actually an, an ellipsoidal horizon when you plot it out with the Earth at one focus and the galactic center at the other. And the reason for that, why isn't it a sphere? You know, because if you think of this, actually the super wave travels out as a sphere, a shell. But because you, for us, we have, to, it, we have to allow for time for the radiation to reach us. So if 
this, uh, these cosmic ray electrons are generating radio waves at some star system. You have to allow time for that radiation to reach us. And what you see is that there's a, a shell of radio radiation out there that we are inside of that's being generated by these superwave cosmic rays as they go out and they interact with magnetic fields and so on. And when you plot that on a graph, that model fits like a glove to the what's called the cosmic background, radio background radiation which is acknowledged that it's produced by cosmic rays, but scientists didn't really have a good explanation of why it's there. You know, they were suggesting, well, maybe there's supernova explosions that go out and contribute. Um, the model, the superwave model prediction fit better than anything that had been published before. Is that the same background radiation that most cosmologists believe is evidence for the Big Bang? No, no, this is, that's the microwave background okay. you're talking about. This is the radio galactic radio background okay. and more recently they found there's also a gamma ray galactic gamma ray background which is d diffuse emission and they can't explain why is it diffuse um, they would expect if it was due to stars you should see clumps here and there of gamma rays instead it's very diffuse and again I believe that's due to the shell of cosmic rays going out so when the thing is that most of the energy from the superwave ends up being directed outward from the galactic center. So once it passes you, uh, you don't see it very easily. It's only th this radiation that we're seeing that astronomers report is only when the cosmic rays end up getting caught in a magnetic field and they turn their searchlights towards us. In other words, they're beaming that energy, that radio emission, outward in the direction they're traveling. But if they get caught and turn around, We'll see some of that, but that's a small fraction of those cosmic rays. So w we are very aware when it's happening. When it arrives suddenly, you know, we're going to see a bluish white star in the sky, similar to what the Hopis talk about. And we'll see a lot of activity of sort of aurora-like things around the uh, iliopause, uh, uh, that shell around the solar system. Uh, we'll see uh, activity in our own auroral activity in our own magnetic field. What about, what about the effects on DNA? Have you posited yeah. any possible effects on... Well, it, you, if you figure the levels we're talking about, because you can't postulate two great cosmic ray uh, intensities, because otherwise, if that was the case, uh, the surface of the Earth would be radioactive, like you have huge carbon-14 levels. In fact, that was a restriction that I had to put in my model. And um, looking at the levels that are reasonable, you would have had uh, a slight increase of mutation rate, maybe a doubling or tripling mutation rate at that time. However, it's not really the superwave cosmic rays that are the most, of most concern. It's the ones from the sun. Because once the sun, this is only in the case of very long-lasting superwaves where the dust has come in and surrounded the sun long enough to aggravate it into what we call a T-Tauri star, because we see sun, stars similar to our sun that are in dust cocoons that are very active and spewing out uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares, super solar flares. So once the sun goes into that phase, and a, a, one of these very large events like extinction level events hits the Earth, then uh, not only are you dealing with major mutational change, but also possible death if you happen to be caught outside when this happens. And it's interesting, geologists have found a connection between extinctions and magnetic reversals. And they couldn't really understand why uh, is, is, is there this connection? Because if the Earth's field went to zero, you get maybe a doubling of the uh, cosmic ray background on the Earth. So that wouldn't be enough to cause an extinction. Uh, maybe it would accelerate a little the mutation rate. But if both were due to a coronal mass ejection from the sun, it, it was an extinction level event, that would explain it. So they're both due to a third cause in that case. They're not directly causally related. Now, it sounds very compelling, certainly to the degree that we can talk with you about this on a non-scientific level, as it were. 
But what measure of support and interest have you had from the mainstream scientific community? Uh, I've been, for example, to the Galaxy and Solar System Conference, and there was a uh, also the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in uh, Houston, where I gave a poster paper. Uh, I stood in front of a board where I had the whole thing laid out and explained to people who would come up, and did talk with some fairly high-level cosmic ray astronomer or astrophysicist who found the whole idea very plausible. So I haven't had anyone publish a paper against the theory. You know, I, w I was hoping somebody would because I would have nailed their ears to the wall. <laughs> I feel the evidence is so strong to support it. Basically, in general, why aren't they all coming on the bandwagon? Well, it's a major change of the paradigm. The paradigm is that Everything is calm out there. We don't have anything to worry about. Uh, you don't want to get into catastrophism because that makes you emotional. Emotion shouldn't be in science. We shouldn't be scared when we do science. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't really get scared by this. I just am studying the past. You know, it's something, you know, you are concerned. It's something we should know about, about our future. Um, but science has traditionally stayed away from these areas, anything dealing with catastrophism. If you look at all the flack that uh, the group from Berkeley got when they made the discovery about the dinosaurs being hit with a comet or asteroid, um, they were attacked by many people, many geologists, who felt uh, we should only do geology based on what's happening in the earth, volcanoes, this sort of thing. So, and that was something 65 million years ago. Now you can imagine what I'm talking about just uh, 13,000 years ago, or 16,000. Um, it's in, within the realm of the human race. And um, so it becomes, the, people are more fearful to join and they're, they're wondering, well, if I s write in support of his theory, what's the consequences for me? But I have had my paper cited that I published. I published in referee journals, in several well-known, in monthly notices, um, in uh, astrophysics and space science, uh, to name a few. Uh, EOS, which is a, more of a scientific uh, newsletter. Aren't you dealing with also, I mean, this galactic superwave, you're also dealing with this kinetic physics. Um, Subquantum kinetics? Subquantum kinetics as being part of this galactic superwave theory in some way, form, or fashion. I mean, you're, you're actually talking about, if you're talking about subquantum quantum physics, you're also talking about what is the ether made of such that the galactic mm. superwave will impact or create impact in how it impacts space and how it impacts... Well, ether is a controversial topic, which right. indeed uh, subquantum kinetics is an ether theory. But you, you don't have to bring that in for this superwave phenomenon. The superwave phenomenon can be based to totally in the, um, the current view of physics, I pretty much. I understand that. But I'm interested because you obviously are thinking about both things that there must be some kind of place where they link up in your own mind. Well, well it was theory. really my work in subquantum kinetics that brought me to the discovery of the superwave phenomenon. And how and that, that's through a long that? path. <laughs> well, I mean, can you explain that in, in sh you know, sort of easy terms to understand at all? Well, I had been developing subquantum kinetics for many years. Um, I'd basically written up the early papers, which I was at the point uh, ready to submit. I had already submitted to a few journals. And uh, at the same time, in the meanwhile, I was studying ancient lore because I, well, back in 1975, had uh, discovered that the tarot encodes concepts very similar to what I was talking about in the physics. And I did take a class in Cambridge, Massachusetts, uh, on the tarot. And as the teacher was going each arcanum. Now the, the tarot is a set of 22 cards that are used in fortune telling. 
but they date back to the um, Middle Ages from the Gypsies. The earliest decks are attributed to the Gypsies, which uh, had migrated from India through Egypt. And esoteric scholars believe that they had picked up the concepts from the Egyptian priests uh, and prior to the collapse of the priesthood uh, in the very early days uh, the, the kingdoms of Egypt the priests were in power they had an indoctrination into this ancient science that explained how the universe was created and that these concepts that were they were at that time there were frescoes on the wall of the chamber that the new priests were brought in and taught the meanings that these were later put into the tarot deck um, anyway, so can you trace one of those particular scientific concepts as depicted in the tarot and how that relates to kinetic uh, subquantum, subquantum kinetics? kinetics. Well, subquantum kinetics is uh, based on process. It's the idea of it's an alchemical ether, basically. It's an ether that's not static like the 19th century ether that physics grew out of but one more like in, in uh, closer to Heraclitus concept. His, uh, this is an ancient Greek philosopher who said that all is process. Um, closest Isn't that like is to think of the all is motion? Aren't you talking about everything? That's being close motion? to the idea, but uh, here it's more a reaction. There is motion uh, in terms of the, just like you have in a chemical solution, you have molecules diffusing from one place to other place, but they're also reacting. So basically it's the same understanding you have for how your own body works. So how is it that the structure of our body is made from the reactions and diffusions of chemicals? You know? and so this is a very organic concept. It's more like close to the organic uh, ideas of Star Wars, of the Force, and you know, very close. Um, the, the galaxies bound together, you know, the universe being bound together by a fabric, uh, organic fabric. You know, it's sort of like every part of space, this ether, is affecting every other part of space. Okay, it. and would you, would, if I called it energy, would that be the same thing? I don't use energy because I, use, I save that for electromagnetic waves. It's energy-like, but you can't speak of energy at the subquantum level. Oh, I see. It's some... Um, there's a prime mover, something that moves this reaction forward. It's a unidirectional. It's okay. sort of like the direction of time in the big sense, capital T, moving forward. And, and since we have a secret witness that also talks about he's tapping into what he calls the information field, and when we said, is that the same as the consciousness field, he would say, no, because he thinks the consciousness field is, you know, is individual-based, Whereas this thing he's calling the information field would encompass everything. Mm -hmm. is, is, this, is there any kind of way you could have a dialogue about what, because this gets to signal non-locality, for example, if you're familiar my, with that. My, my view is that to explain what's here, we have to postulate higher dimensions and a flux of ether that we cannot directly measure, but only hypothesize. And the way you know it's there, there are experiments that you can do that shows that there is an absolute reference frame, that relativity is wrong. I give many experiments in my book. In fact, uh, our, the geopositioning system that the military uses is based on the idea that light goes faster in the direction of the Earth's rotation than the opposite direction. And if they didn't uh, accept that, which is anti-relativistic, uh, they would not uh, locate people, their forces on the earth. They would maybe bomb the wrong embassy. <laughs> okay, so if you could explain in terms of, I don't know if you can do this, but in terms of y your subatomic model, how can you explain that to us on the basis of an experiment? Well, um, there's what's called chemical waves. Scientists were, at the time I was getting the idea for subquantum kinetics, they just published work on the Belousov-Zabotinsky reaction, which is a chemical reaction where you put some dyes 
in there that change from red to blue depending on the state of the reaction. And there's a molecule, cerium, which can go between two valence states. And as the reaction churns forward, cerium in one given place in space oscillates. They call it chemical clock. So if you stir this up with a little stir, your reaction will change from red to blue on regular, just like a clock. And they call it the chemical clock. But if you leave it unstirred and calm, it will form little wave patterns, uh, sort of like a bullseye pattern with, a, let's say, a blue center and a red ring and then a blue ring and so on. You, an effect like Meaning the... Meaning a spiral. Uh, only, no, actual uh, concentric rings, like okay. Atlantis. <laughs> Remember Atlantis? In fact, in my book, uh, In Genesis of the Cosmos, I suggest that the Atlantis myth is actually, they're describing a subatomic particle based on this new physics. Now, uh, understand that my theory came out of systems theory. It was only later I saw the connection with the ancient science that was being discussed symbolically. But uh, getting back to the reaction, <clears throat> this would be red and blue waves. They become spiral waves. In fact, they were on the cover of this magazine, spiral waves, because they look, they're, they're more artistically appealing, so that's why they concentrated uh, about spiral waves. But that happens only when you give a little mechanical disturbance to the, so that the, the, the rings I reconnect see. to form a spiral. Uh -huh. So, okay, so how does this... Well. How does this relate? Well, I thought, well, this is an interesting model for subatomic particles. I was reading Einstein's uh, treatise in uh, Scientific American. He was talking about uh, his difficulty in unifying electromagnetism and gravitation. And in there, it talked about his view that there were no such things as singularities, which would mean Einstein himself would be against the black hole theory. And his reason was it would dis disrupt the space-time fabric which he believed should be continuous. And he believed particles were bunched, places of a bunched um, energy, so to speak. And I was saying, well, here, this is looking like a, a bunching here, you know, where you have a core with this wave pattern around you. So the core is really a high concentration of a certain element. And I was saying, instead of working with molecules, like you do in chemistry, let's uh, come up with a new name Etherons, I initially called it uh, subphysical units, but later I said, "What the heck? Go all the way. Let's let's use <laughs> let's forget about the uh, taboos." And it, the ether is an ancient concept, and uh, people weren't afraid of using it. And all the if you look at the real experimental evidence and stop regarding science as a religion, you know, it is very <laughs> religious in some ways. Uh, in the sense that uh, existing physicists religiously believe in their their theories and to the point of ignoring the evidence against them. But uh, so you can imagine this soup of etherons of different types, A, B, C, D, and so on, reacting according to a certain recipe. And what I did was come up with a, a set of reactions which I believe were physically realistic. In other words, they created physically realistic particles that produced electric and gravitational fields just like regular matter that uh, would obey the classical laws of electrostatics and gravitation that would bind, have nuclear bonding. Um, and it made certain also have spin characteristics and it would it made certain predictions astronomical predictions one being that uh, light waves that their energy should not be constant but they should uh, over great distances of going through intergalactic space they should lose energy in other words redshift do they they do uh, and that's what's called the cosmological redshift and uh, where scientists have interpreted the cosmological redshift as an actual velocity effect due to a recession of a galaxy. In other words, if the galaxy moves away, it would cause this effect, which is very mechanical, mechanistic interpretation. Um, they didn't, well, the tired light as theory, as it's called, the idea that light waves lose energy as they travel, was proposed about the same time as this other theory. But the thing was, they didn't have a reason for it to occur. 
you know, it was another way to interpret it. Um, the, and the uh, more mechanistic was easy, more easily grasped, and so they went with that. And that's why we have the expanding universe theory today. Uh, I wrote a paper for the Astrophysical Journal in 1986, which is uh, the top journal in astrophysics. It's the same one that uh, Hubble published in. The, uh, the, the astronomer they attribute the expanding universe to and uh, showed that if you look at the data and compare the uh, expanding universe model to the stationary universe model with tired light effect instead of motional effect, you find that the tired light model always comes closer to your data. And I did it on four tests. And the reason I did it on four tests is that when you adjust your model, because Big Bang theorists are adjusting their model to fit the data because it never fits the data. So if they want to adjust the, their, their model, that's fine with me, but they have to be consistent And what are its effects on these other tests. And you find that their model ends up getting pushed further from the data as soon as they try to adjust it here. And that's why they'll always publish on one test and not on four simultaneously. Okay, so how does your theory, um, you're talking about tired light, how does this relate to your theory of kinetic sub- Okay, well that's just, that's physics. one of the predictions that came out of subquantum kinetics. That was a testable prediction and I went ahead and tested it by looking at the data to see did it support it or was the Big Bang Theory correct? And because at that time I was just like everyone else believing in the Big Bang Theory. Hmm. But I wanted to give this a, a chance and you know, slowly I realized, my God, you know, subquantum kinetics is right and all this other stuff is baloney that they've been teaching. So what happens? Okay, the light Tired light means the light, you're talking about energy dissipating, right? It, it or actually, changing form. In subquantum kinetics, the energy actually leaves physical, the physical universe in a sense that the wave just diminishes in amplitude. Energy is not a constant in subquantum kinetics. Why? Because subquantum kinetics proposes that the physical universe behaves like an open system. What is an open system? It's like we are an open system, biological organism. We must eat, we have input and output. We must breathe, we take in carb oxygen, give out carbon dioxide. If those processes cease, we die. And the same with the chemical reaction model, the chemical waves. It, you only see the waves as long as the chemical reactions are taking place. As soon as they use up the food chemicals, and they go to equilibrium, the waves disappear, dematerialize, and so, so to speak. So the same for this physics, uh, the physical universe would dematerialize if this flux, which we should all be thankful for in my opinion, were to ever diminish or cease. Well then, between dimensions, I mean I don't know if this is related, but it, in theory, between dimensions then, that's exactly what's, what must happen in order to dematerialize you ha and move between dimensions that that energy has to dissipate to such an or come down to zero so that you can move to the next because if it dematerializes it goes into another dimension okay you're talking about the a physical being like a human being maybe wanting to that's you're talking about the soul you're well actually i'm talking about well i mean what i'm thinking about is the the ability for even uh, ghosts or uh, ETs to go through walls and mm. I mean and now we're actually seeing movies in which you know the uh, powers that be have created um, and I don't know how do they do it but they create uh, techniques by which oh, you can change the, the the composition of a wall such that you can go through it yes I believe this is something that's possible if this model works on the subatomic level that you're talking about it has to Okay, well then, it has to work all the way up, right? Hmm. To, the, to the fact that you get to yeah. the uh, larger particles. With, with subquantum kinetics, you can explain dematerialization and rematerialization. This is uh, something that's easily done. Okay. Uh, and it involves a change of the gravity potential. If you were to increase the gravity potential enough, an object would dematerialize or at first it would become invisible which means if you look at a change the gravity such that it becomes heavier or lighter 
be lighter. Okay. Uh, like the sun is in a gravity well. The sun is um, a very, in a very materialized state. Um, if we were to go out into space, uh, w way far from the galaxy, because the galaxy itself is in a gravity well, we would go into the area where I was saying photons lose energy, this tired light effect. Everything there would tend towards the, a homogeneous state, would tend to dematerialize. If the opposite effect is within the galaxy, instead of having uh, light losing energy, it gains energy here. It's the opposite. And you have blue shifting of light. And in fact, I made a prediction. I called up JPL in 1980. I said, have you seen any, uh, anything with your signals to your uh, spacecraft, microwave signals? Maybe a uh, slight blue shifting of the signal. Say, so, well, no, we haven't really uh, looked for such a thing. Say, so, well, keep an eye open, see what you see, because if so, it would support my theory. So around about mm, seven years later or so, eight years later, they start noticing. Oh, by the way, I published this in 1985 as a test of uh, my theory, that they, if you did a test uh, sending a microwave signal from Earth to Jupiter, to a spacecraft in Jupiter, and relayed it back, you would find the energy was slightly higher. And I said, how much? Because my theory would predict what that amount of increase would be. Well, about seven or eight years later, they start noticing something's a little peculiar in our data. It's, all, it's becoming blue shifted. It's as if there's a force pushing the spacecraft towards the sun. And they finally published this in 1998, and it became known as the Pioneer Effect. And then they published further information four years later. Now, there have been thousands, literally thousands of papers written by physicists about the Pioneer Effect, trying to explain it, what it is. There was only one paper published before it was discovered that predicted it, and that was in my publication of, of Subquantum Kinetics. It was published in the uh, 1985 in the International Journal of General Systems. So did JPL come find you when you were proven correct? I sent a copy of my book marked where I made the prediction because I, the paper actually took a picture of the original journal and uh, marked where it was uh, stated and also sent a copy of my book which further explained to the head man on that publication team at JPL basically was ignored. He didn't even send me a preprint of his paper that I requested. Um, so all I had was the news announcement. I, I, he never told me, you know, well, it's going to be published in this journal uh, on, on this page. No, I, he never told me that. And I was never mentioned four years later in the follow-up paper. So, you know, my experience is uh, uh, the average uh, physicist or NASA scientist or astronomer is a cowboy. He's interested in his own theories, not in yours. If, you, if he confirmed yours, that he, he's not interested. <laughs> That's the way it works. Yeah, okay, but the implications of what you discovered um, could point to the, the reality of other dimensions, de as you say, dematerialization. Mm -hmm. You're actually, you may be on the road <clears throat> to explaining how other dimensions could exist. Right. Subquantum kinetics is a unified field theory. It explains all of the forces that unified field theories deal with. And it's, um, it fits together like a Swiss watch. Relativity effects come out of it as corollaries. You don't have to postulate ad hoc like Einstein was saying. Um, and there are now 12 predictions that were previously published that said things entirely different from what physicists were saying that were later verified by observation. So these are like confirming certain, the th certain things that has predicted were confirmed, and I don't know of any thing that's said so far that's been disproven. Um, so it gives you a lot of encouragement to believe that we've got something here, plus the fact looking at 
general relativity had only three predictions that were confirmed. Now we're dealing here with 12. Plus, you find that ancient civilizations had this physics. They, may, they went to a lot of trouble to encode it in some of the most important creation myths that historians have written about. And even it's encoded in the zodiac. And even though the zodiac is used for horoscopes, one of the main technologies used in uh, field propulsion, this uh, exotic propulsion that's developed in black projects. In fact, the B-2 bomber I've discussed in uh, my recent book, Secrets of Anti-Gravity Propulsion. I explain how the B-2 bomber uses Brown's uh, research uh, and patents basically it's based on his ideas. Um, so w with subquantum kinetics it's not just explaining Brown's work but a whole host of other technologies too like John Searle's uh, technology, uh, Eugene Podklinoff's gravity impulse beam in which he's able to produce gravity impulses from shock, electric shock discharges, which are uh, the gravity impulses collimated, can go for kilometers and kilometers, staying uh, together, and he's found that actually travels superluminally. So this could be the centerpiece of a superluminal propulsion engine. Uh, from what I've seen, I've seen actual demonstrations of superluminal shock propagation in the laboratory, Guy Obolansky's work. Um, and with this technology of Podklinov's, uh, I would say it's possible to do superluminal space travel, uh, which completely changes our outlook of uh, interstellar communication and interaction with other beings, that it's possible that they could actually travel here. Uh, another thing that comes out of subquantum kinetics is it completely changes what we think is possible for energy and you find uh, th these technologies where they're getting energy out of water, like uh, John Eccles patent that they're developing in the UK, and they say they'll have a hot water heater out in the next year and a half or so, or Randall Mills invention uh, produced by Black Light uh, Power Company, and uh, he's got something like 20 of these prototypes uh, being tested that he believes will produce 50 kilowatts of power for your average house, that these are explained by subquantum kinetics, because subquantum kinetics leads to a revision of, of um, quantum mechanics. There's a flaw in quantum mechanics. Even though quantum mechanics is workable, the model is incorrect. The, the wave packet model is incorrectly formulated. It's, it, and when you go to the subquantum kinetics version, you get the same results. It explains experiments with the same mathematics, essentially, but uh, it allows the possibility for s ground states in the hydrogen atom that are more, more levels of energy in the hydrogen atom. It allows the uh, hydrogen electron to jump down and release energy that we thought wouldn't be there. And that's what these uh, various scientists have tapped into with their inventions. So, so <clears throat> subquantum kinetics leads to the development of a lot of new energy sources that would be considered alternative energy. Okay, so, it's, go ahead. It's hard to understand why, why other quantum physicists haven't picked up your work with a lot of enthusiasm. What's your explanation for this? Is it it, 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 it's, too, it's too, no. Is it because it's too big a scope or it's too radical? That, it's that. It's too big a shift. It, um, new, new theories are picked up if you're not changing the basic structure, the basic paradigm. If it's a new idea within the existing paradigm, it will be very quickly picked up if it's going to explain things better. I'm talking about basically wiping the slate clean uh, as far as theories go. Most theories, uh, most modern theories, you can keep uh, some of the classic uh, equations, uh, Newton's equations, and uh, so on. But uh, Maxwell's you, you, well, Maxwell's no. I mean, <clears throat> it even uh, revises that. You have to look at Maxwell's equations as a model, 
of, of a phenomenon. It, it explains electromagnetic wave propagation in a different way. And uh, for one thing, Maxwell's equations, uh, at least the accepted version, have uh, energy being conserved. It means that energy of a photon can either increase or decrease. Whereas here, as we were saying earlier, over great distances, you will see a change. Um, um, there are a set of, uh, of principles which are considered sacred in physics. One is the first law of thermodynamics, this idea that energy cannot be changed, only converted. And you're changing that law, really, are you right. not? And uh, I can show technologies which you can perform in your backyard garage which show a violation of energy conservation. Some of these uh, electrostatic thrusters, like uh, Jean-Louis Nordin has on his website some uh, Lafourgue thrusters. They're basically asymmetrical capacitors that he's got in a pinwheel arrangement. And when you calculate how much energy he's putting in to drive that pinwheel, it's a lot less than the motion he's getting out of it. He's getting out about three times more emotional energy than the electric. It has to be an open system, to go back to what you were saying before. The universe, yeah. yeah sure. As soon as you view the universe as an open system, you have to realize that energy is not necessarily conserved. Pretty much all system theorists will agree with you. If, you're, if your physics is postulating an open system for the universe, then you, you do have the possibility of matter or energy increasing or decreasing in amount in the physical universe. The thing is that this is like a, just a, a small shadow on the sort of an epiphenomenon of this vast flux that's going on below the level of observation. So that's where your real energy is not energy, it's uh, action. Uh, so in other words, just for this table and this uh, stool or, ta or chair to be there requires an enormous expenditure of action, subquantum flux, which is totally invisible to us. And we only infer that it's there through series of uh, conceptual models and understandings. Are you able to, to theoretically predict the physics behind an over-unity engine as a result of this? Can you predict how to design one before you start tinkering in your garage about this? Well, yeah, it could lead to some predictions of that sort. Um, but in, in the way it's, it's generally worked with me is I've read about people's work in this area and find that I can explain what they're finding with subquantum kinetics. Okay, yeah. But, so. I, I mean, sorry, perhaps I didn't form my question in the right way. What I really meant was, <coughs> from your theoretical understanding, could you predict which engineering approaches are more likely to be successful? Yeah, yeah I think so, yeah. Uh, I think that with this physics, you can explain a lot of the technologies they're developing in the black projects for field propulsion. Yeah. And I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, a lot of my readers are in the black projects. I would have no way of knowing. <laughs> but um, Yeah, that's what I, I was thinking. I mean, they, they were actually working on ether theories uh, in the 50s to explain electrogravitics. Brown, Townsend Brown was developing an ether theory. They were working one at, on one at Douglas Aircraft, which apparently they ditched, and it eventually was declassified somehow with some notes. Maybe it was just some notes that somebody had that were supposed to be classified, but they were leaked out. Um, and from conversations I've had with some Black Projects engineers who acknowledge that to them the ether is real, mm. that uh, they realize the faults of relativity, um, that when they recruit they prefer that uh, the people they're recruiting haven't had their minds polluted with current physics, they try to get them at an early age. That's exactly what we've heard, yes, they pick mm. up yeah. very, very, very bright Absolutely. 
And, and it's actually to the advantage of keeping the secrecy that they, they would see it's good for them to keep teaching baloney in the universities that they realize is wrong because what they're doing is impossible in that frame, frame of mind. Yeah. And it's very difficult for people to get out of that. It's sort of like asking the goldfish to discharge its tank of water. It's not going to want to do that very easily. Yeah. Oh, for sure. But it must be immensely personally frustrating for you to consider that it, to consider the possibility that your work may well not only be correct, but be taken to levels which you would love to be in on, and yet you're locked out of this because maybe they consider that they don't need you, they understand it already. I mean, mm. That's the kind of expediency that they would... I'd actually been asked to participate in one project um, that was being formed, gotten off the ground, but I saw that it was going to be a secret, even though they were intending it to eventually be open, but you never really can be sure what will be the result. So why did you, why did you stand back from that? What, what was your motivation? I guess there's the risk of being locked in on the wrong side of the door. Yeah. You know, when you start working in secrecy, you feel a little stifled. Uh. Well, are you the, that rare thing, a, a scientist with a conscience? Is that I, why? I guess you'd say so, yeah. Um, and is that a result of, of your parents' influence, would you say, to some degree, or oh, yeah, something well, else? Yeah. I would say that's part of it. Um, yeah. um, just, uh, you know, just me, I guess, that uh, my interest is in helping humanity. And I'm interested in the truth and not living in some dream of some belief system that other people are telling you and doesn't fit the, the data. Um, also the elite, in other words, the elitism around using technology or using the truth only for a certain group of people perhaps is, is going against the grain? Yeah, the thing is, who is controlling the black project? As soon as they're black, I mean, they're not even acknowledged by Congress or the whatever government has them, somebody's pulling the strings. And, and there's some people that suggest they aren't even from Earth, no, if you believe. That. Now, can we get back to, I mean, you did say that you had some kind of contact experience that affected you. Are you able to describe that in some detail, Tess? Well, it was basically an inner experience I had uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins in my junior year. And I felt uh, I was I had a there were there was information coming into me. I was in a certain mental state. I felt there were intelligences from the plant kingdom. I felt they were terrestrial. That the trees were talking to me. The veg vegetation kingdom of Earth that was concerned about the way we were going. They, they were concerned also about being wiped out by the progress of human. Society. It's like we are out of control here with growth, um, sort of like the movie Koya Nesquatsi, that whole concept. Um, and at the same time, they were giving me the basic understanding that the basis of existence is flux. Because if you have flux, you can always produce structure. In other words, if the flux goes in a loop, now you have something that exists over time, because it's the same and the same. Whereas if you start with structure, structure itself doesn't imply flux because you're dealing with something that's static. Why should it move? It's not. It's static. So that's the beauty of flux. And that shifted my whole perspective and I started on this quest of understanding nature, developing my own system theory before I knew there was such a thing as system theory. And that eventually led into development of physics, this subquantum kinetics, which I developed while I was studying business, actually, at University of Chicago. It was a course on organization theory. We were asked to write a term paper, and uh, I had, the, the course was studying general system theory and viewing si uh, businesses as open systems. And it was in this experience where I started 
melding the idea of open systems with Einstein's article that I had read and chemical waves and so on and suddenly had this epiphany. And it was, the paper that didn't end up being on business. <laughs> he, the, the professor who uh, has psychological, behavioral psychological background ended up giving it to a friend of his who was, had a physics background to evaluate. And, uh, and the rest, as they say, is history. Mm. No, I mean, because it, that sounds like it propelled you into a, to the direction you've gone on. Yeah, I had, I remember I had a sort of a, what you'd call a Kundalini experience during that where I was awake all at night writing and then I'd sleep during the day and get up at the late afternoon and be walking around in the, uh, in the mall, the university, uh, the grass area between the buildings and would look at a tree and I could see this energy flux in the tree or the stone looked like it was alive, sort of like with the view of the shaman Indians. Because um, it, it completely shifts your perspective when you go to this. Mm -hmm. mm. It, it's more close to the Hindu idea of Maya, that Maya is illusion, the physical is, is an illusion. It's just we're waves on this, uh, the real essence is the ether, uh, which <coughs> is not material. Is that connected with um, uh David Bohm's Implicate Order? Um, it, it's a <coughs> close, but the concepts are, <coughs> excuse me. So, okay. The concepts uh, of subquantum kinetics are similar in some respects to David Bohm's theory, but Dame's, David Bohm's working in a general relativity, relativistic framework, which he hasn't completely wiped the slate clean there. I accept some of his concepts like his idea of stochastic fluctuations as a representation of zero point energy. That this is, that this is not just the idea of probabilism in quantum mechanics is not just some equation you're writing but it has a real basis in something, some medium having stochastic behavior there. <clears throat> in this case I, I would say it's the ether. But I use different terms. I, I speak of the implicit order and explicit order. The implicit order is the etheric order. And the, the, it's ordered in the sense of the reaction pathways that are very defined. And the explicit order is this, the wave order that we see, that we're able to see. We need w waves to see other waves. You know, everything is waves. So um, that's the quantum realm. The subquantum is the implicit order and the quantum is the explicit order. And the explicit order evolves out of the implicit order. The reason why we have a particle that's a wave pattern, subatomic particle, the reason that exists is because you have this cyclical yin-yang sort of reaction going on at the subquantum level. Yeah. Yeah. So just then a, a manifestation of what's already there just emerges. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um. It leads to a continuous creation, cosmology. Sure. So, so that matter is being continuously created even this moment. Yes. It's not something that happened all at once like the Big Bang Theory says. It, it's going on, especially at the highest rate at the center of the galaxy, but also within stars and planets. Well, what about the idea that it's going on outside of the galaxy in other, um, like there's, uh, there's a theory of Ananda Bosman talking about what he calls the great magnetic attractor, that there's other, and he said, you're saying within the galaxy there's a black hole or whatever, it's not a black hole, but you're saying this. Mother star, I call it. Okay. Very old star, it's the oldest star in the galaxy. So beyond this, because there's lots of galaxies, right? So do you go beyond that? Yeah, every galaxy is creating matter and energy. And uh, if that go continues, these galaxies will grow and grow. They'll spawn other galaxies because they'll eject star clusters. You know, our, every time the core explodes, it ejects star clusters. That's what populates the halo of the galaxy. Some of these, if they're very large ejections, will actually be small galactic nuclei that will end up spawning a, another galaxy. 
to think of the large and small Magellanic clouds that are very close. They could have been ejections from our own galactic core, or maybe they just happened to nucleate close by. But you do see some that look like they came out from the core of a mother galaxy. And Halton Arp, an astronomer, talks about this, uh, that there, some of these look like as if they were ejections from active cores. Um, but eventually, you could say, an extreme, maybe the all, whole universe become filled with matter and energy. It's po very possible before we would even get to that point that the set point that's causing all this creation would change. You know, something that might have a, a period of several hundred trillion years, like in the, the Hindu view, the Hindu mythology talks about Vishnu waking up every so many hundred trillion years. Um, that would, and everything dematerializes. He, all of the Maya is withdrawn, and everyone realizes all along we were Vishnu, we were this essence. So, but is it possible there could be then another eruption? Yeah, it's the idea that not only we have cycles in terms of core explosions, but also the whole universe goes through a cycle of creation and dissolution. Um, so you're not a fan of the standard Big Bang Theory. Well, it's interesting that they had it right in, a, in one way. There are big bangs, but they're at the centers of galaxies. Not There wasn't a single big bang creating everything. And interestingly, uh, these big bangs are associated with creation because the, the creation rate is the highest at the, in the mother star, as I call it, in the core of the galaxy. And that really goes out of control. It's like a nuclear reactor going supercritical, where it ends up going into a very active state, expelling all this matter and energy that had been created for thousands of years, is now expelled. And as this is moved away out from the core, then the gravity potential field that was gradually getting deeper and deeper around the core now comes up a bit and it cools off. The reaction cools off because like I was saying in subquantum kinetics, this whole creation process is tied to the level of gravity potential. So that's why there's a cycle involved. So creation is always going on but then it gets really extreme and goes through this outburst and then things subside. It's almost like uh, with a volcano that releases the pressure that's built up underneath and it goes into a quiescent period. Going back to um, Maxwell and electrogravidics. Have you spoken with Tom Bill? Uh We we met. Uh, we were talking more about his uh, free energy device, uh, which I, I don't know if he's actually got it working at this point. Um, Actually, there's some concepts that are similar. Bearden has some similar thinking in some areas uh, to subquantum kinetics. Mm. Okay. But Just we haven't really yeah. discussed it. Sure. Okay. Um, but rather than drill down there, because we need to wrap this up, yeah. is there a way we could kind of pull in some of these threads into something that would kind of make sense mm. in terms of where... Uh, where you might be going now with your work, and why? Well, uh, like right now I'm <clears throat> writing a paper on the mass extinction at the end of the Ice Age, which I believe was due to a solar cause, a coronal mass ejection striking the Earth. Um, I, I'm hoping that by by advancing uh, in, in various areas. Uh, it's sort of like a front that you're pushing in various places. Like before I was writing more in this subquantum kinetics. Now it's more close to climatology and catastrophism. Um, in the hopes that some, of, some advance will get people very excited. I'm hoping this will get them excited and attract more attention to what I've been saying. Well, what about the idea of um are you thinking that you might be getting close to some kind of model of consciousness itself? I have done work on that too, is the feeling tone theory model that I developed in the 80s uh, based on Bill Gray's work, who's a system psychologist, psychiatrist, 
and uh, melded his idea that thought is really based on feeling tones. It's very really feelings when you get down to it. And was able to explain how those feeling tones emerge into a thought using concepts which are similar to what I use to develop subquantum kinetics. It's really a system theorist goes can go at a very abstract level and bring stuff from one field into another, which is what I did there. And that theory also it matched very closely with a lot of neurophysiological data, a wide spectrum. It was sort of like hitting the target 11 times. <laughs> and uh, uh, we did some consulting to use aircraft, which used that as their way of enhancing creativity. And um, I was later told that they saved $40 million using this approach. That, that was, if you put some price on the increase of creativity that resulted. Yeah, I mean... I think it's safe to talk about that since their use aircraft isn't around anymore. The, in theory. It's all been <laughs> broken up and... Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice to be rewarded with a few percent of that added value? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Starburst uh, could do a lot more in contacting the scientific community and attending conferences if we had uh, our coffers. Yeah. Well... <laughs> I read, for instance, that there's some um, just routine scientific work that is is expensive but it, but accepted like for instance mass spectrograph mass I'll say that again mass spectrographic analysis of ice core samples that would really do a lot to bolster your theories and it just hasn't been done because it's so expensive and you're working on your own is this yeah in fact uh, this theory of the m mammoths and mammals being wiped out by coronal mass ejection uh, which I'm, it wasn't just one, but there was a series over several thousand year period, but there was one real major one that sort of ended it. Uh, that you can test that. You know, I've located the place in the ice core. All we need to do then is uh, sample for beryllium-10 and see did beryllium-10 spike up at that time. Look also at carbon-14 in sediment cores. And uh, these are things that can be done to test the theory. So I'm hoping once I get this published, I can convince uh, some others, some colleagues, that we team up and do this. Right. Because that's simple stuff. I, I mean, scientifically speaking, that's simple hmm. stuff. Yeah. OK, well, um, let's say that maybe this interview will kind of go towards that direction of attracting people to you that could make these things possible for more investigation in all of these areas that you're working in. But um, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to explain this to us in a way that we could understand it, which I think you did well. And um, hopefully we can learn more about your theories and also the applications of those and, and see what, what kind of pans out in the future. And we do know that there are some smart people in high places who do watch our videos because they're never quite sure what we're going to come out with. <laughs> they watch us quite carefully. Mm. That's and right. And these are not necessarily bad guys. These are smart mm. guys and they're good guys. And it's entirely possible. Some of them. Some of them are. And it's entirely possible that, uh, that if your work hasn't come fully to their attention, it may just give them a little prod to take another mm. good look at what you have to offer here. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, uh, uh, that what you mentioned about you heard from this fellow who was in touch with a black project, or he was a black projects engineer, talking about space travel with superluminal spaceship. Right. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if part of that is misinformation. I don't think it was our superluminal spaceship he's talking about. It was from an ET civilization. They'd been in touch with ETs who told them this. Entirely. And it may have... I mean, that may be entirely accidental because he may well have been relating that story second or third hand. But the principle <coughs> was that he said, there's a wave coming. Uh, he couldn't describe it exactly. He wasn't a physicist, actually. Um, he was an operative rather than an engineer. He said he thought the time scale was more like 2017, but he did say that superluminal craft had been out, taken a look at it, had reported what was going on, and that he said it could... Uh, I think his words were something like, it could just be a puff of wind or it could turn the earth on its axis, but nobody really knows what's going to happen. Well, well I've, I've recently uh, deciphered a crop circle, the one that shows the Avalon one that 
from 2008, chose the uh, solar system, the planets arranged as they would be t in 2012. Right. I think uh, I remember reading something where you were talking about this. Hey, you know, Pluto's not where it should be. David Wilcock has uh, uses that in one of his talks. Yeah. Right, and uh, because I know one uh, fellow who's uh, believing that this means the superwave will arrive in 2012, and he's actually working with people to build a shelter down in Australia right now, expecting that this will hit 2012. But uh, my reaction is, why would they put that obvious error in there? Uh, and so I looked at it and noticed in the, the diagram that appeared one week later that shows what looks like Neptune's orbit, that circle, and it's marked, which seems to represent Pluto's crossing point on Neptune's mm -hmm. orbit. And then it's got a little elliptical diagram with little uh, circles as if dividing it 11 equal parts. And to me, that's an exa elliptical exaggeration of Pluto's orbit so that we don't mistake it as a circle, showing 11 subdivisions of Pluto's orbit. If you take the period of Pluto's orbit and you divide it by 11, you come to the amount that Pluto's displaced in that crop circle. And if you add that to 2012, you come to 2035 A.D. with the exact date, June 8th, when that crop circle appeared. In other words, it would have been 27 years into the future from 2008, okay. hmm. which is interesting. So what are they saying? Does that mean that's when a superwave will arrive? Will it be the time when the, the current one will end, that, that it might arrive 2012, or what? You know, we don't know. But uh, there is something on the Pulsar diagram that even before this happened, I had written about it on my website. Um, somebody had discovered that, having read my book, they, said, they wrote me an email said, by the way, did you know that the periods you put, you attracted our attention to the Crab and Vela Pulsars, which are these two supernova remnants, which are very important, close to us in addition to Volpecula Pulsar. That did, and I had stated the periods for these three, that they sort of form a symbolic arrow, if you understand the, the, the Pulsar diagram, as I call it. That the periods um, are very close to the Fibonacci series, which create the golden mean. And sure enough, if you take the ratios of the two uh, longer period ones, they come to the golden mean ratio, with, to within that, uh, it's 10 to the minus fifth, the difference. In other words, 100,000th is the deviation from that, mm. being perfect. Uh, but you notice that the crab period is significantly off, and this is assuming if uh, the second is a universal standard in extraterrestrial communication now, because I'm suggesting that the pulsars are an extraterrestrial message, that um, Pulsar is at 33 milliseconds, so if it's really 34 is the number you come up with in the Fibonacci series. So if you say when would the crab pulsar have that period where it ends up being 34 milliseconds, well it's in the future by so many years, and it comes out uh, not very far from this 2035 uh, date. I was coming up with something like 2037 or something, 2038. So something it seems like. Something's going on here. It's interesting. Right. So there's some kind of message there, but you're actually deciphering it differently than 20, some of the 2012 enthusiasts, if you will. Yeah, I think uh, there's not enough uh, information to immediately conclude that they're telling us we will be hit by a superwave on 2012. Although a lot of people have contacted me who said, you know, they've been in telepathic contact with ETs who are telling them 2012 a superwave will arrive. In fact, one fellow said he had this ET contact and they were telling him about cosmic ray wave coming and he wanted to know more information about it so they said, well, just look up the work of Paul L. <laughs> <laughs> so he did a surf with Google and found my work. If, if this is, I don't know if, uh, you know, if this is true, I mean, maybe they're aware of my website, I don't know, I, there. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's that's a great place to to, to end. Okay. Oh, we still. Uh, yeah. Thank you. That's that's lovely. Thank you very much, Paul Laviolette.